Uh, I think there's something wrong with the sim. I'm seeing an anomaly alert saying almost a million customers' endpoints went offline around the same time. A million? No way. Is it the same customer? No, it looks like many different customers. It's all over the place, too. Well, let me create the live telemetry data table first before we announce the world is ending, just to make sure. Okay, let's see. So let's check the Falcon sensor agents that were all online in the last hour, summarized by account, and 25,604,000 records returned. That seems normal enough. Now let's check how many agents are online now, minus the difference from an hour ago. Okay, so Falcon sensor agents that were last known online five minutes ago, summarized by count, and we'll calculate the difference by subtracting the last known online in the last hour. <gasps> Minus 2.2 million. That can't be right. What is it? What's wrong? Uh, hang on, let me run this again. Minus 2.3 million. 2.5 million. 3 million. What? There's nearly 3 million less agents online now than there were an hour ago, and the number is rapidly decreasing every time I run the query. There's no way this can be accurate. Something else must be going on. Bro, I think it's real. We just got an escalation email from support. Delta Airlines is saying about half of their systems are offline, and the state of Alaska's 911 systems are offline, and Seattle Children's Hospital patient infrastructure is also offline. Holy shit, is this an attack? I mean, it has to be. This seems too coordinated to be a coincidence. Covering this story all day long, beginning with Good Day LA, I can tell you this, people have experienced a whole range of emotions, from anger to tears, to in the end, resignation. On July 19, 2024, at approximately 12.30 a.m. Eastern, organizations around the world would experience what we now know as the most catastrophic, widespread IT outage we've seen to date. Infinite blue screens of death, everywhere. Critical infrastructure and emergency systems brought down, over 10,000 flights canceled, hotels impacted, hospitals impacted, not only in the US, but worldwide. So what happened exactly? Was it an attack? Just bad luck? Who is to blame, if anyone? Ironically, extremely ironically, the critical incident that permanently crashed 8.5 million computers was actually caused by CrowdStrike, one of the largest cybersecurity firms in the world. But how did this happen? Normally, companies have a process in place where one or more persons or automated tools checks any code that gets moved from the test environment to production where customers might be affected. What's happened in this case though is that some code got pushed to production, wasn't tested properly, and ended up corrupting a critical system file that's part of CrowdStrike's endpoint detection and response platform. Specifically, it ended up corrupting a driver for what's called the Falcon sensor. The driver file that got pushed, being corrupt, caused the Falcon program to crash everywhere, all around the world, almost immediately. Normally, when an application crashes, it simply closes. However, the thing that made this so bad is that the Falcon driver operates super deep within the brain of Windows, aka at the kernel level, or ring zero, just above the actual hardware. This is really good for efficiency and good for being able to look for bad stuff before it has a chance to do any real damage. However, if any of these layers suffer a catastrophic failure, everything else that's on top of the layer that depends on them will crash. A really easy way to understand and think about this is, imagine the very lowest layer of the architecture stack, the physical layer, gets damaged like in a fire or something. The rest of the computer architecture is likely unable to function because it relies on the hardware. In the case of the Falcon sensor driver, since it's operating at the kernel level, if something catastrophic happens and it crashes, it's possible what's called a kernel panic can take place. If you're running Windows, you'll see the good old blue screen of death, the system will completely halt and you'll be forced to reboot. To add insult to injury, the Falcon sensor driver was a boot start driver, which makes it required to load before Windows starts. This resulted in the following. CrowdStrike would push the corrupted kernel level driver, the Falcon sensor would load it, the Windows would crash, Windows would reboot, Windows would attempt to reload the corrupted kernel level driver, Windows would crash, Windows would reboot, and this would just keep happening forever. So why exactly did this happen? 
In short, it can be summed up as they simply weren't testing. But this begs the question, why would such a widely used critical component affecting so many customer endpoints go untested for so long, especially by one of the largest cybersecurity organizations in the world? Is it just gross negligence or is this part of a deeper conspiracy? Time for a super quick break. If you're enjoying the content so far, please turn on the notification bell for us. Remember, it's not just me producing these videos, but a whole team of people doing their absolute best. You turning on notifications would make us very happy. We appreciate you watching and back to the content. On the 19th following the outage, the CEO of CrowdStrike, George Kurtz, made a couple of bold tweets. Both tweets failed to issue any kind of apology, which he was absolutely roasted for, but more notably, he claimed in both tweets that what happened was not a cyber incident, which is just incorrect. The entire discipline of cybersecurity is built on three pillars known as the CIA triad. C, standing for confidentiality, being to protect information from unauthorized access, I, standing for integrity, being to ensure data accuracy and consistency over time, and finally A, which is availability, being able to keep data accessible and usable on demand for those who need it. And the incident with this company, CrowdStrike, resulted in the absolute decimation of Pillar 3 by bringing over 8.5 million endpoints around the world permanently offline. And these weren't just random computers at people's houses. These were enterprise systems that supported critical infrastructure such as 911 systems, healthcare systems, airports, travel systems, and more. The guy's company single-handedly flattened the availability pillar for over half of Fortune 500 companies, causing over $5 billion in damages, and he's saying it's not a cyber incident? Are you sure about that? Of course it's a cyber incident. As defined by our discipline, it's a cyber incident. This is actually more embarrassing than if the company got breached by a bad actor. Think about it. Don't worry guys, we weren't attacked by any hackers or nation states or anything. We were actually the ones to cause the most widespread denial of service in history, all through our own gross negligence. This whole situation really brings to light what could have happened if this were actually a malicious actor trying to do some real damage. This also begs the question. How could the Windows operating system be so fragile that a third-party application could bring down almost 10 million endpoints in just a few hours? Microsoft must bear some responsibility for this, right? What's wrong? Seriously, you auto-updating now? <laughs> Microsoft! Remember how earlier we said the Falcon Sensor's driver needed to operate in the depths of the Windows operating system, the kernel? As it turns out, other non-Microsoft operating systems, such as Mac OS, uses a special API specifically designed for low-level security operations in order to tightly control certain interactions with the kernel to prevent situations like this. I know this sounds super complicated, but let me explain. Imagine you're going out to eat at a restaurant. You, the customer, will sit at your table and order a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, for example. The server will go to the kitchen and tell the chef what you want. The chef will make your PB&J sandwich. The server then delivers the sandwich to your table and you eat it. This is much how an API works, where the API is the server and the kitchen represents the kernel. The server manages your interaction with the kitchen and the chef to get what you want, but it also prevents you from going into the kitchen yourself and doing something stupid. And if you think about it, like sure, most customers could probably go into the kitchen themselves and manage to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich all right, but that 1% of people might burn the kitchen down, which is precisely what CrowdStrike did. Instead of relying on a dedicated waitstaff, aka using a secure API, CrowdStrike was allowed to park their own customer in the kitchen, that customer being the Falcon Sensor. Every day, CrowdStrike would give their customer a list of stuff to cook, until one day, they accidentally told it to cook a peanut butter, napalm, and fire sandwich, and that's exactly what it did. CrowdStrike's customer in the kitchen, aka the colonel, made the sandwich, but the napalm ended up getting everywhere and burned the kitchen to the ground. So why doesn't Microsoft just make an advanced API specifically for low-level security operations to prevent things like this from happening? The funny thing is, they actually did try to make such an API, 
Dave from Dave's Garage, a former Windows developer, actually spoke on this. Filtering, but the Windows filtering platform, or WFP, allows applications to interact with the network stack without requiring kernel-level code. The irony of all this is that at one point, Microsoft actually tried to do the right thing. Behind the scenes, sources indicate that Microsoft had been working on a solution that could have potentially prevented such disasters. The tech giant had developed an advanced API designed specifically for security applications like CrowdStrikes. This API promised deeper integration with the Windows operating system, offering enhanced stability, performance, and security. It was a proactive measure aimed at mitigating the risks associated with low-level system interactions, which are often fraught with complexities and potential vulnerabilities. However, as Microsoft prepared to roll out this game-changing API, they encountered an unexpected obstacle. Regulatory bodies tasked with ensuring fair competition in the tech industry scrutinized the new API. The regulators in the European Union argued that providing such a powerful tool exclusively to certain applications could give Microsoft an unfair advantage, potentially stifling competition from smaller security firms that wouldn't have the same access. Now, despite Microsoft's assurances that the API would enhance security for all users, the regulators stood firm. They feared that integrating this API could create a dependency on Microsoft's ecosystem, effectively locking out competitors who couldn't leverage the same level of access to the Windows Core. If you're wondering, what about Apple though? No Macs crashed. Well, this is because Apple controls its entire ecosystem, including the hardware and software, allowing it to implement stricter security measures without requiring them to provide the same level of kernel access to third parties like Microsoft does. Microsoft, on the other hand, must develop Windows to be able to run on a variety of different hardware platforms. Many businesses and individuals rely on legacy systems and applications, which require compatibility with older software, and this is just something that Microsoft has to deal with. If Microsoft were to move to a more restrictive model like Apple's, this would disrupt these systems and alienate a significant portion of Microsoft's user base. Microsoft did actually try to take steps in the past to prevent this issue, but they were shut down by regulators, so it's not exactly fair to put much blame on Microsoft in this case. But what are we supposed to do moving forward? Is CrowdStrike the only organization that has kernel-level access on Windows systems? Time for a short break. If you're interested in getting into cybersecurity in the funnest way possible, we created a hands-on CyberInch community where you can practice cybersecurity operations, threat hunting, and vulnerability management in a real cloud-based environment with the option to partake in a technical cyber internship. You'll gain hands-on experience with fully licensed enterprise-grade cybersecurity tools like Tenable, Defender for Endpoint, Microsoft Sentinel, and Microsoft Azure, all in an actual production environment shared with other community members. You'll face both simulated attacks and real-world threats from actual bad actors and malicious bots on the public internet, creating a dynamic and authentic learning experience. Like I said, there's an optional cybersecurity internship where you can add actual experience on your resume and LinkedIn from my company, Login Pacific, by completing various vulnerability management and threat hunting related tasks. Numerous interns have landed full-time roles in both IT and cybersecurity. Click the link in the description to learn more about the CyberRange community, full transparency guaranteed. The CrowdStrike incident has brought to light a vulnerability that has largely gone ignored for a long time. The situation is actually insane if you think about it. A large chunk of critical infrastructure across the entire globe was taken offline because of a single company's poor code review process. Absolutely wild. Ideally, there should be some kind of law that would state something like, no single organization should have kernel level access to over half of Fortune 500 companies. That might be a good start. Or perhaps, Windows can only allow kernel access strictly via API. Third-party kernel-level drivers are not allowed. Because bear in mind, CrowdStrike is not the only organization whose products require super deep kernel-level access within Windows. There are also tons of other anti-malware security software, graphics drivers, anti-cheat software, virtualization software, and more. It's going to be really interesting to see what kind of legislation is enacted after this incident and how security frameworks and guidelines are adjusted. Because if nothing is done, bad actors are absolutely going to try to take advantage of such widespread, deep-rooted access. Especially nation-states and other well-funded, advanced persistent threats will go to crazy lengths to achieve their goals. For example, a foreign nation might create a completely fake background for someone who happens to be an expert developer with extensive experience in kernel-level development. 
and then that person's mission would be to secure an engineering position in a large US tech company to carry out some kind of harmful malicious activities. I understand that does sound like a Jason Bourne movie, but that's the world of cyber warfare and advanced persistent threats. If you like this video, you're definitely going to like the next one. It's a real story involving someone I know. Basically, their friend's phone got stolen, the police wouldn't help, so she went through this whole operation involving social engineering, cyber espionage, and extortion, all to get the phone back. It's a crazy story. Check it out.